What were you going to do for NASA? It was a big NASA Class A mission, cost five and a half billion dollars. Is the universe expanding? Our understanding of physics is fundamentally incorrect. I left seven plus figures on the table. You could have just explored the universe at the at the JPL lab. Yeah, but I wouldn't have got to control where I explored. Instead of saying China's the enemy, what if we use China? How fast could we build it? The thing that I had a real problem with at JPL was simply saying, What were you going to do for NASA? Work that, on Europa Clipper. On what? Work on Europa Clipper. What is that? That is the mission going out to the moon Europa to go do a scientific discovery mission on it, right? It was a big NASA Class A mission, cost five and a half billion dollars. I was going to be a piece of that wheel at JPL. Uh, and then, you know, at JPL, like you get hired, you work on some of these and um, you you go on to the next mission and blah, 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 as you go through. A lot of people have had really great careers at JPL and get to talk about some some really cool stuff. And JPL has these like inspirational pictures of people working on Voyager and people working on, you know, curiosity and spirit and opportunity and like these these kind of monumental missions that we've done as humans. A lot of them have come out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So again, it, it's not about cash. It's not even about the job. It's about you could be a small part of, of, of writing history. I mean, where where did you say they're going? Europa Clipper is going, it's going to one of the moons. It's going to Europa. Which moon is that? Where is that? I think it's, a, it's a moon of Saturn. Fact check me on that. Is it Saturn or Jupiter? I, I mean, that's pretty cool, man, that you got, you had the opportunity to do that. And you switched and started this. It's either cool or so. stupid. I don't know. I think like you kind of, I say this all the time, you kind of got to be stupid to start a company. Like all the, ins all the kind of math doesn't math. You're like, hey, hold on. I can make a lot of money going and do, I mean, look, to be honest with you, Sean, I was at a company called Bird Rides, which was the scooter company. And we can go into why I went there. It's, it's actually not important. I wanted to learn how you built if you had no constraints. Like if you use China, instead of saying China's the enemy, what if we use China? How fast could we build? And I was blown away by how fast you could build if you got rid of all your preconceived notions about what you could do. That's why I went to Bird. When I left Bird, I left seven plus figures on the table to, to go start this company. Why? Probably because I'm stupid, but also because it's not what drove me, right? It, it, the money is, is great. I don't come from a wealthy family. I wasn't rich growing up or anything like that. And I just... Look, I think if you can, if you can afford to go to dinner and not have to worry about the bill, you're in a pretty good fucking spot in life. That's it. I don't need much more than that. So like, let's go do what you want to do. And I asked myself the question of, if I had Elon Musk level of wealth, if I had $300 billion, what would I do? I'd go try to explore the fucking universe. So why don't I just go do that now? That's all this company is. I think it's more than that to me, <laughs> but uh, I mean, because you could have just explored the universe at the at the JPL lab. Yeah, but I wouldn't have got to control where I explored, or saw, or actually saw those missions go faster. The thing that I had a real problem with at JPL was simply saying, "Hold on, our missions in, in spacecraft cost four and a half million dollars. Europa Clip cost five point five billion." a lot of zeros in between those two numbers and you don't see that in what's produced and i'm not saying what's produced as a nasa class a mission isn't a really great mission really great people work on it what it is though also is a jobs program and when i talk about the same reason we're not a government contractor jpl is right that's what they're doing they're a contracting agency and you see that in the work ethic there you see that in the people there and you see that in how it's constructed there's people that definitely dream about space there and there's visionaries at jpl but there's also people that are clocking in and clocking out. And that kind of culture just doesn't, doesn't attract me. It doesn't interest me. When I, when I want to do something, I want to go all in to the point where it's unhealthy. And if I'm not unhealthy about it, then like, what's the point? I don't, I don't live for the weekends, right? I don't, I don't actually even live to retire. Like, I live for this. I live for the experience of what I'm going through today to see if, to see if you can make it, to see if you can have a lasting impact on the future. I love that. I love that. What else excites you in space? Or do you, do you, is there anything else? Or are you a hundred percent? Like, do you dive into anything else? I mean, look, I, I like any, like anybody that's around space and you're around this, what else excites me? I think there is a revolutionary going on in, in rocketry right now as we look at it. And whether it's the RDE that I talked about, whether it is a starship coming online, I think starship is it's a fucking hard rocket to build, man. And I think you're seeing that you're seeing that the, the you're seeing that move fast culture really get tested right now with with how Elon is building Starship, and I hope Elon, 
I hope Elon goes back to dedicating himself 100% to SpaceX because I think he could he could really make an impact there on Starship. I think it needs it needs that back in there. And then you have vehicles like uh, the rumored new Armstrong, which will be um, Blue Origin's Starship competitor. I don't know if it's real or not, but I fucking hope it is. It's kind of like like aliens. I hope that these companies are working on bigger rockets, right? Because it's it's fucking cool. I want to see what that revolution enables. Now, what it's going to enable is two things in my mind. It's going to enable different business cases. And so you're probably going to have more Starlink competitors come out. I don't I don't know what else. I don't really care because those are all boring. And I'm sure those people make a lot of money. Again, all my friends work in those industries. And I tell them this. If you're low earth orbiting, like, I don't care. It's boring. I want to see. <laughs> like, it just is. It, it, just, it just doesn't excite me, right? It doesn't. Like, Starlink, really cool technology. I don't care. That's the honest truth. I don't, it's, I want to see what we do with the science side. Like if, if Starship comes online, we can launch some gigantic fucking ass telescopes. We can get really far. We can launch cheaper interplanetary missions. Can we actually go colonize Mars? Can we get there? Can we become multiplanetary? I don't know. To be clear, I don't know the answer to any of this. All I'm saying is I really like when people go try. Same thing with Ashford. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm 100% confident this is going to work and I'm going to pull it off. I actually don't know. I think the magic in this is that you still got enough, you know, you still got enough balls to go for it and try. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that the, when I re, t this is what I watch at night. I just fall asleep to space documentaries. I fall space to sleep to war documentaries. So like, you know, say my wife laughs at me all the time. She's like, dude, you're literally listening to people like die in Vietnam and you just pass out to that. Like, that's how you go to sleep. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, like it's a great story. It's right. Like, <laughs> Is the universe expanding? So when we look at, again, I'm not a physicist or scientist, so I'm probably going to get shit on for this. But what I'll say is when we look at data from telescopes and we see light shifts on galaxies, they appear to be moving away from us. And so the logical thing you can draw from that is that the universe, again, it is a, it is a hypothesis based on an observation we have in space. So we've seen something that happens. We've seen a redshift out of these galaxies. We think they're moving away from us. Everything's moving away from everything each other. is moving right. away. From, well, not everything. Andromeda is moving towards us, right? So not everything is moving away from us. Certain things are moving away from our galaxy, um, and when we look at that, we can make the assumption that the universe is expanding, and we have no fucking idea why. Right? We don't know why it's accelerating. So there's two ways you can look at this. You can either say, well, probably three actually, the universe is expanding. Our understanding of physics is fundamentally incorrect. Our understanding of how to take these scientific measurements is incorrect. Um, I think we understand how to take scientific instruments. I think you have to, to say, is our basic thesis for physics correct or are we missing something? And I think there's a lot of holes in our modern way of physics, but it does a really good job of explaining all the phenomenon that we witness today and we see here. And it kind of falls apart at the super small and the super large. And, and we don't know why. But... It's really, really interesting to go talk to some of these people that are going and trying to solve these problems and, and the math they do and, the, and the, the way they look at this. I mean, you know, Kip Thorne's discovery of gravity waves was essentially just math equations. And he said, like, hmm, I see this in mathematics. I should be able to see it. And here's how I think we would be able to see it. And that's pretty fucking cool, man, that we can go from that level of understanding of math and, and, and make observations that then 20 years later we can detect as gravity waves, right? And... and, and and see these experimental results. And so is the universe expanding? We observe it to be expanding. Is it or is it not? We can get super philosophical here on like, what is expanding? What is the universe? What yeah, is time? Yeah, let's do it. Like, you know, there's all Go these things. It. I love this stuff. There's all these variables you can have there. And if you start to question the fundamentals of every variable, um, you can lead to some really interesting theses. And so, like I said, there's a thesis called variable light theory, that, that light is not static, that we don't think the speed of light is, is a constant. That obviously goes counteractive to all other physics, right? And probably I just talked to somebody, totally I think wrong. it was Baji Bhatt, who is, is sending up satellites and wants to beam solar energy back into Earth. He was talking about, I think it was him, he, he had, he had uh, mentioned that we've recently frozen light. 
I don't know how you freeze light, but that's pretty sick. But that's yeah, cool. But they they said that they was it. I think it was uh, I think it was him that was talking about it that had mentioned that we had we have found a way to freeze light. So this is where the math becomes super important because we say we can't travel faster than light. That's wrong. We can't travel faster than light in a vacuum. We can travel faster than light in different mediums. Right, And so like, there's all these different ways to chalk up what we're talking about and how you take your assumptions and, and make them different. And this is where the math and the details, details matter. Details matter a lot. And we start to talk about these kind of math equations and the way we look at physics, like you gotta dive into detail. So what does freezing light mean? Did we go really cold? Did we use a different medium? Does it mean it just slowed down? You know, how do we look at this? Like people love to put Hollywood on top of these physics discoveries. Mm -hmm. And the reality is they're not usually that Hollywood. They're actually usually pretty mundane and boring. And that's why I think going back to my original point is like, I really think you should do this, Sean. It's just like, when you're reading one of those, just call the fucking author. We will so Call now. the paper and say like, hey, what does this mean? Or I was talking about the, you know, call Kip Thorne. He's at Caltech. Like, he will pick up the phone. Um, when I was at NASA Goddard, there was a guy named there named John Mathis. And uh, he discovered the background radiation of the universe. Won a Nobel Prize for it, right? With the mission in 92, I think it was, that took that famous picture of the background radiation of the universe. I literally just walked up to his office and was like, can I talk with you? And he's like, dude, come in. I'm just working on this. Like, come in. What do you want to talk about? And I'm like, these people, we, we kind of hold them up as like these fictitious characters that are that are that are different than us they're all just people they're all just humans yeah some of them are fucking total oddballs but like what they are not is celebrities and i think that's important because that means they're accessible and as soon as these things become celebrities where we're watching documentaries on them usually those that math has been convoluted so much to, to help explain it to us as, as laymen that you're actually not getting the true story of what's happening and in some cases you'll have the original authors of these papers or these, these theories come out and say like it's actually not what i was saying at all like, this doesn't make any sense. It's not what I meant at all by this. I mean, a good one, again, the, the Psyche Asteroid saying it's worth a hundred quadrillion dollars. Talk to Lindy about it. She's she's the PI for the NASA Psyche mission. She's like, this is not what I meant. <laughs> I didn't mean like, oh yeah, it's, I, was, I was trying to equate for, for how much is on this, how much material is here in, in forms somebody else can understand. But that's been taken differently. And, you know, that's that's kind of how this works. So a couple of questions just from what you were talking about. One, I want to talk about background radiation in space. I don't know what that is. But before that, you mentioned traveling faster than the speed of light in other mediums. What do you mean by that? Light travels slower in metal. Ha so, okay, so what does that even mean? Because it seems like you put a chunk of metal in front of light and it, it doesn't go through the other side. It blocks it. So, so what does that mean that it travels slower through metal? Any kind of fiber, whether it's, look, there's a whole bunch of ways, I guess, to slow down light. Mm -hmm. Whether you talk about fiber optics, it's going to go slower. And this is because the photons are hitting other atoms and being deflected. Um, light, well, what, I'm, what I'm getting at there is when we talk about these equations, though, the details matter, right? When we say light travels at a constant speed, we're referring to light in a vacuum. And so all of these ways we describe this science, again, those variables are the important piece of it. And if we forget about those other variables, we lead ourselves to believe falsehoods that are not true. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.